fantastic story uh, to tell you, and um, so I'd just like to introduce Astrid Forholt, Finding Your Own South Pole. Astrid. And that was a kind of 
scary uh, question because your dreams is something you have inside and you don't always want to tell people about them. But I, I, I answered him. It's uh, to go uh, to Antarctica on a long and challenging uh, expedition. That is my big dream. <laughs> but I also said, um, I don't think I'm good enough. Because it's like you're always there and you always have to do something more before you can do things. And I said, oh no, I think you're good enough to do that. Uh, what route do you want to go? And I said, I, I haven't planned on doing that uh, or anything yet. And he said, okay, I'll go home and think about it and I'll come back to you. And uh, we went home and after a few days he called me and he said, Astrid, I think you should go Amundsen's route to the South Pole. We have been waiting for a, a woman <coughs> with the, um, th that we think can manage to do that. And I think you have the qualities to do that. So, so I think you should do that. And I was about to fall off my chair. <laughs> what, what are you saying? Amundsen's route? Really? <laughs> um, and there was lots of thoughts. Uh, spinning around in my head and I was, wow, well, the race between Scott and Amundsen has been taught in schools all over the world and now he wanted me to go that route. And the worst thing um, of all was that now I would be seen. But then and there I decided if he thought I could do it, uh, I was going to do it. And from that day on, uh, I put blinders on and I never looked back. So that was my starting point for a long, long journey. <laughs> so now a big job was to be done and thank God that I didn't know what it was going to do. <laughs> Otherwise I would, would probably not have started.
It was at home that the most challenges lay. In Norway, we say that 80% of the trip is in the preparations. Guess who we have learned that from? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Amos was brilliant in planning and, and uh, details. Now I had to use all the experience that I had gained through my previous expeditions and there was a lot of new things to learn. I had to go out and be visible and for me that was uh, the most difficult thing. And I didn't even have a Facebook page at that time. So there was lots of things to, that I had to learn. Um, there were many challenges that awaited me, but I had made up my mind. I had to solve one challenge at a time and, until I reached my goal. One of the biggest challenges for me was getting sponsors. I found it very difficult to have to go and ask people for money and also to compete with young, well-known athletes for their sponsorship programs. After all, I was an almost 50 years old lady who had a dream of going to the South Pole. My first sponsor meeting was absolutely terrible. <laughs> he asked me if I knew how much a million kroner was and what it would take to earn it, since I had a budget for several of them. My budget was on 6 million Norwegian kroner, 600,000 euro. So it was very much. <laughs> But I told him that, honestly, I had to admit I have no idea how, what it takes to make a million. I, have, I, I am a nurse and I have never earned a million or never will. will. So, whether he felt sorry for me or just thought that I was the craziest person he had ever met, I don't know. <laughs> but he joined and, be, and became my greatest collaborator. Uh, I had many ideas and many did not become anything I could use. But this one was incredible funny. Find yourself all. There is a YouTube lesson again. <laughs> I called it that. And what I did, um, or, or yeah, it took me three years, and I made a, a, um, three different websites to try to make this work, but I couldn't find the recipe for it until this one, and that worked really well. I um, created my own crowdfunding. I know you use that more than we do in Norway. So, what I did, I challenged people and smaller companies to come, uh, come with me to the South Pole with their picture on my sled in exchange for them paying a small sum each. I also challenged them to go for a dream of their own and make it a reality. So my sledge is over two meters long and it was filled with pictures. So it was really, really nice to have that with me on the, on the journey. It made me feel that I was not alone when I was going. I had someone else to bring to the South Pole too. In such a large project, not everything goes smoothly. There were many things that changed along the way. I injured my foot and had to postpone the trip for a year. I was told by the airline company that they could not take me out to the start of the route, so I had to learn how to ski sail in order to get myself out to the coast. I had to replace my assistant because of the postponement when I injured my foot. And finally, when
when there were three months left before departure, the flight company told me that they were not, there were no other people going on the flight out from the South Pole um, that we were set up on. So they cancelled it unless I could pay another million Norwegian kroner. And I could, I said, no, it's enough. <laughs> I can't risk any more money. So for me that meant that they left me with 70 days instead of 80. That also meant um, that many of the plans had to be changed. There were changes to meal plans and day stages. You had to go longer days. Um, 10 days less did a lot and the margins became smaller. <clears throat> All these things presented many challenges that had to be solved before we could leave. So think how easy it would have been to give up because so many things went wrong. Well, a little apropos, as we call it in Norway, I don't know what you say. <laughs> Would you have put your money on this lady if she came and asked me this question? <laughs> well, someone did. <laughs> Countless hours of training had to be completed. And food for the trip had to be planned. And here I had many new ideas. As you know, Amundsen was concerned with details. Uh, and this one, this is one of my qualities as well. I have spent a lot of time figuring out how to manage to feed myself as best as possible on the trip. As I have seen many people come from long trips and be very thin. Try again? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to try to do it differently. So I got to work with a doctor who was a specialist in sports medicine, uh, nutritional medicine and altitude medicine. Everything I needed in one person. Together we made a plan for how I was going to eat during the expedition. And my goal was to reduce the recovery time and absorb all the food I ate. So I would hopefully not lose so much weight. So this is um, our breakfast, breakfast uh, and planning. Um, all the others here are um, food per day, and in the red one you have for a week. So it's lots of food. But now we have to go down to this continent. <laughs> uh, it's time to go a trip to Antarctica. This uh, uh, inhospitable continent at the very south of the globe, which is the size of the United States in area. As many of you probably know, both Almond's and Scott's route goes in from the coast, where they entered by boat the year before the expedition started. Now, uh, we will be flown in via Punta Arenas in Chile to Union Glacier. Um, what was going to be one of my big challenges was that I couldn't be flown out to the starting point at the coast. And we were not allowed to go in the year before and spend the winter anymore. So my trip had to start in the middle of the route where we where we um, uh, got dropped off and then we had to ski sail towards the coast then turn around and re-enter uh, re the route. So this is Punta Arenas and we got flown out here to beneath Axel Heiberg 
and then I had to go all the way out ski sailing and then go back in again. <laughs> so as far as we know, it's the first time in Antarctica that the expedition uh, has not started at the starting point, <laughs> but had to uh, have a transport leg first. So this became a completely new and challenging way of doing it. We were flown in by a large Russian aircraft, which at the time was used to fly supplies into war zones. So they had some time off and they spent their time flying into Antarctica. <laughs> There was a large hold uh, and they had installed a few rows of seats in there. Uh, otherwise we were sitting together with a lot of luggage and equipment that was going into Antarctica for the season. We landed on ice and that in itself was a bit of an experience. They had a big screen in front of the plane so we could see when we were landing. And there was mountains in front of us and we were going down there. <laughs> so, uh, because they couldn't use the brakes that much, we, when we landed, they landed uphill and then turn around and slide back down on the icy runway. So it was, whew, yeah, welcome to Antarctica. <laughs> then we came into the base of Union Glacier. Uh, and here we were uh, staying until we got a flight uh, out to Oxlade-Hayward. And we were waiting for flight weather. Because we were going on the other side of the continent uh, towards the Bay of Wales. It took eight days before we had uh, flight weather at all three places where we uh, had to go to down and land, and two, two of them was to refuel. Um, so there also had to be a weather window big enough for the plane to land on the same spots on the way back home and um, go back to Union Glacier. So, so yeah, it's difficult <laughs> to, to really make it to the other side of the continent there because of, of the weather. And it's in the start, the starting. Um, it is the start of the season, and it's also, yeah, more bad weather at that time. So when we um, landed out there, we had lost four more days of the seventy days that we had for the expedition. So now there were only sixty-six days left. We were dropped off in the innermost part of the Bay of Wales and were allowed to sail for three, three days before there came a storm from the mountains behind us and we were stuck in the middle of a storm eye for five days. Now it was just a matter of 
changing the focus and not losing the softball in the other end. On this continent, Mother Nature decides. So no, it was just a matter of playing along and continue to do the job from day to day. As we went inward, the mountains began, um, the mountains began to come towards us. And I had one more little dream that I want to do something about when I was down there. I had received a tip that the photos from Betty Toppen and Amundsen's can, which um, Amundsen took, did not resemble those that were later taken by an expedition that was in the area. They also reported that the can in which Amundsen had left a jug was now empty. They had put down a memorial plaque there, since this now um, is the only Norwegian cultural historical memory we have in Antarctica. So I wanted to see if this was true or if there were more cairns. I went to look at this little black tri triangle on the little peak in front of Betty Toppen. I thought by, like Amundsen. Uh, no, I, sorry, I thought like this. If Amundsen knew how cans were built in Norway at the time, he would, um, it would be visible from several sides and it would be possible to reach it. After all, he had to put down a can of fuel because it could benefit others later. So what I did was put in a day off, a cultural day, <laughs> and I went skiing in to check if, it, if this was Amundsen's camp that I could see. And I could see it from a long distance, this little peak. And it was his camp. Um, the same that he built in 1912 on his way back from the South Pole. His jug was still there and half full, and there was a small box with the sound of a matchbox inside. The letter he left behind, uh, we know, was taken by someone else on another uh, expedition, I think it was in the 1930s or around there, and is now in private uh, possession in the United States. The matches here are mine. I use them and my flag to measure the jug. We don't uh, know anything about it, so so that was yeah, that was a, a nice thing to do to manage to find it. And um, I also wrote down the now the correct, uh, correct uh, coordination on the correct at the top and on the correct count. So now that's done too. I put it down, write it down on my glove. <laughs> so now there is actually the wrong name on the top down there. And I spent several hours going up um, to, to the top of it and getting the plaque and putting it down on the, uh, at the right place. I 
think it was very good for me to see that because there was not so much snow uh, and you can see all the crevasses and the cracks very clearly. So here is roughly the route drawn in that I had to follow. But it was something else to see it from ground level and to know where uh, we should choose to go up. So, where would you have chosen to go up here? <laughs> I choose to try to go up here between the two skis. Um, I just have to show you this. Um, I think it was absolutely, absolutely amazing uh, to look at this mountain. You could see it from far, far away. And it's Mount Nansen, with its 4,000 meters of altitude. It's named after Fritjof Frit Nansen, uh, who had lent the skip from to Amundsen to go to the North Pole. So now he was on his way to the South Pole, so I think it was quite appropriate to name the biggest and most beautiful mountain down there after him. So Amundsen himself took this picture. And I did the same 106 years later. Axel Heiberg was, a be was beautiful, but incredibly difficult to climb. We had to walk two and three times with equipment to get it up uh, the steep slopes and step by step up because of the altitude as well. The cracks were there below us and they were enormously deep, I think several hundred meters. <coughs> But there was lots of drifting snow from the plateau on top of them. So as you can see here, you can see out here, they're going big, big cracks, but they're under the snow. So you know they're there, but you only see the country of them. Yeah. And at December the 14th, that special date. Yeah. I suddenly spot this shadow in the glacier. Do you recognize it? <laughs> I will show you some more pictures from Axel Heiberg Glacier because it's so, so beautiful there. This hill you see in front um, here, uh, it's the way up to the triangle. And we went six up, up there, and a few times up and down to uh, get all the equipment up. And after a day we had gone 25 kilometers. But on our trekking on the trip, it, only says two and a half kilometer. So that was all we gained by going 50, uh, 25 kilometers up and down. So it was lots of work to get the Oxlaheberg. This is Amundsen's ice fall, and we were going, this hill was up here, and we were going up here and along on, underneath here. This is the Valley of Silence, and it's seen, um, we're, we're looking back, like, uh, um, back to the Bay of Wales, and you, the mountain we can see there is Don Pietro Christophersen's mountain, also from one of Amundsen's sponsors at the time. And this one is from the plateau, and out towards a Bay of Wales, and you can see the ridge of uh, Mount Nansen, and it's the Valley of Silence. 
So it's very, very beautiful. The Polar Plateau, yeah, that is something. <laughs> when you reach up there, it's uh, like facing a wall of wind and cold. It, you meet just something different, very different. And the altitude didn't make it better. We were going up to about 3,200 meters above sea level, and the air was much thinner. There was about 70% oxygen left in the air, um, there compared to sea level. So everything became much heavier. And I was breathing like a whale, as we say in Norway. <laughs> and it's really, really heavy. Yeah. The snow uh, had completely different crystals, and Amundsen described it as fish glue. I thought it was like walking on sandpaper. There was no slip at all, and now the real toil began. This uh, sledge felt completely inhumanly heavy, um, with its almost 110 kilos. So, yeah, nearly the double weight of myself I had to, to pull. My tent hotel, tent hotel, yeah? was set up in new beautiful places every day. It's strange to think that this thin cloud protects you from the elements and what it, uh, is the only thing that keeps you alive, alive down there. Ice that we melted into water is the only thing this continent has to offer. And we had to have six liters each um, per day. So it took a few hours to melt it every day and fill drinking bottles and thermoses. At its coldest, we had down to minus 70 effective degrees Celsius. When we went through a storm towards the end of the trip, it's so cold that it's completely indescribable. Sometimes I was afraid the clothes would burst from the cold. And it felt as if the blood would freeze in the veins as soon as you stopped. You just had to keep going all the time. There, uh, there will only be a short break for having something to drink, and then you had to put something in your mouth to eat, but you couldn't stay there to eat it. You had to, to go, go on while you were chewing and trying to, to eat. And um, you can imagine the toilet <laughs> you have to do, and you have to go down there and all oh, the pants off and hurry up. <laughs> and I was like, oh, freezing to death. <laughs> mm. So we make a joke of that. In, in these areas, you have to make three pushes, and then you have to be finished. That's how your stomach, stomach uh, is going to work. Uh, I was eating bars and when, when I couldn't take a bite of them so I had to, to put them in uh, small pieces and, and chew them as we were going because they were so hard I would have broken my teeth if I should try to, uh, to chew them. So it became a real uh, challenge to get food in and it had to be done quickly so that we didn't get any first bites. <coughs> and there was also some of these beautiful natural phenomena uh, that appeared. It was so nice to look at that, but it also meant, meant bad weather. So, yeah. <laughs> And eventually, uh, we could also see the South Coast Station in, in a distance. The last day towards the South Pole was very emotional for me. I walked and um, thought of my patient who had uh, asked me to live while I was alive. He should have known what he has 
started. <laughs> in the last meters before the pole, an, uh, an uh, image appeared in my head, where my patient was sitting on the edge of his bed, clapping his hands, saying, you did it, you did it. It was not you made it, but you did it. And there's a difference. And we reached the soul pole with all the participation <laughs> uh, within six hours to spare before the last flight out. <laughs> We were pretty much the same size when we started. Same height, and he was about 8 kilos heavier than me. And we had both put on 8 kilos before we left. We had the same amount of uh, kilocalories per kilo of body weight, but different diets. He used the traditional expedition diet, and I had followed my own plan. So, this is the result. Oh. He lost minus 19 kilos, and I lost only 5. Wow. So, I still came, came home with my cheeks and <laughs> <laughs> <in> my stomach. <laughs> So what I think has been found an answer to with this is that now um, even more and more difficult expeditions will be possible. Uh, we know uh, as often today that food and weight loss are those things that stop many expeditions from it being uh, done. recognize the text on the pole. Look at this. By endurance we comfort. <laughs> Thank you. Sure if I could hold it. Uh, can, can someone just 
because there's only one tape that have that, and I found that, because then I could use it in my face and don't, don't uh, get frostbites underneath it. So, yeah. I didn't get any frostbites, only a small piece here on my tape. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 